but that's different. That, that's a different one. But RetroShare has been in development since 2006, and it's definitely something I recommend looking into uh, because it would allow for a lot of what we're talking about right now. If anybody also, if you have a really, really simple question, if you're one of the one of the 20 or so people that raised your hand that you kind of weren't even on the basics, feel free to ask a dead simple question. Like there's no, no you know, we really want to feel those as well. So it was brought up that uh, people are afraid of the legal liability of running their own access points at their house and stuff like that. And I think a lot of that has to do with IPv4 where you have a hundred people, a thousand people sometimes sharing a single IP address, you know, in businesses and stuff. And you mentioned something about uh, some services for trying to roll out IPv6. As, as far as I've seen, it's mostly just uh, tunneling where it's almost like a VPN service if you want to get IPv6. Um, so what services are out there to um, get IPv6 rolled out further and uh, maybe, because uh, it's almost mandatory that um, some kind of mesh network would have to have IPv6 unless they were doing like a 10 network or something like that on IPv4. And then you're still going to have like some NAT problems probably. And uh, one other thing I'd like to see at Porkfest that we do a mesh network. Um, the, uh, if you have, anyone's ever seen Hackers on Planet Earth, and uh, there's a HackerCon in uh, New York City. They have R the badge. They have badges uh, that have RFID tags in it, and you can track people and stuff. And it's, it's a. I, I kind of think it'd be interesting to see that at Parkfest. Voluntary tracking. <laughs> Wait, I, I feel like we need more specificity. When you say where, what uh, services are uh, available to assist an IPv6 rollout, where do you mean? Well, well, I mean right now it seems like. One thing that it was failed to do, I, when they were coming up with IPv6, it was just basically like, oh, here's IPv6, it's going to replace IPv4, but they never did anything for trying to roll out IPv6 over the IPv4, you know, like a, like a legacy thing. Like, what is there for, is there any way of like routing directly IPv6 so what you're stuff is over IPv4? Like ser servers that are hosting services that you want to use are generally only accept IPv4 connections. Is that right. the point you're making? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, what but, hell, but, right? but what about getting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's I mean, the deal with that? Most of them are not Tor exit nodes either. Why not? You know, like. But but what is there out there? If like someone, if, if people want to start rolling it out in their house, you know, if they want IPv6. There's at an their incredible house, piece of software called Linux. <laughs> <laughs> but but what? what I mean, you're right, though. You're not wrong. DDWRT is easier than DHCT for IPv6. What? I'm pretty sure. DDWRT, you flash your, uh, the router firmware, it will hand out IPv6 addresses. But is there something, I mean, I'm not talking about it's a so land. I'm talking about, <laughs> like, course. trying to get public, routable IPv6 addresses. You have to right now, you have to use a tunnel. It's like the only thing I your ISP. Well, you yeah, have to talk to the ISP or use a tunnel. Are there anything out? Is there anything else out there that can do that? Because you said something about something that is yeah. proud of the IPv6 overlay. Okay, wait. A, a brief intro of what IPv6 is. Yeah. Who who needs like an IPv6 primer? <laughs> See, like not that. Okay, okay. Um, who wants to take it? I'll take it. Uh, IP IP version six, Internet Protocol version six um, is. For the purposes of this discussion, it really is just a, a schema of addresses. You're probably used to IP addresses that look like, maybe on your local network, 192.168.1. something, right? So four, four number, four, three, four up to three digit numbers separated by periods. IPv6 is uh, an address space that is longer and uses 0 through F. So there are a functionally infinite number of addresses. Uh, because we've run out of IPv4 addresses a long time ago. Everything you see on the internet today is some way of covering up the fact that we've long since run out of IPv4 addresses. Um, even though there are some small organizations that probably most of us, whose existence many of us don't approve of, uh, that have enormous blocks of them. Um, but uh, <laughs> so for IPv6, really, IPv6 is an entire protocol, an entire internet protocol uh, that sits on top of TCP. Uh, or UDP, but it's uh, for the purpose of this discussion, we can just probably think of it as a, a address schema, right? Is that fair enough? Okay, then 
Um, so the problem is that by and large, uh, mo what's your name? Steve. Steve. Steve points out that by and large, great, you have an IPv6 address, but you can't actually connect via IPv6 to most service providers because most services in the world are not do doing IPv6. You know, like Google is, you can go to Gmail via IPv6. But by and large, there's just not IPv6 traffic. So like, how do you deal with this scenario? Um, so I mentioned CJDNS earlier. CJDNS is a product, that? what's that? Can you go into that a little more? Yeah, CJDNS is a product that, the, the handshake is like, give me your, your public key, right? So that I can ship encrypted traffic to you. And then a hash of your public key becomes your IPv6 address. And then there's a, a, a routing algorithm that is mesh-like that routes between uh, virtual tunnel devices that each have that have an IPv6 address. So it's not really a solution for the problem that you're talking about. In fact, it's you might almost think of it as a different implementation altogether, uh, and, and a compelling one. I think an extraordinarily compelling one uh, that is to be looked into. I can't believe that it's not uh, more well known and, and more popular. I think it's uh, one of the coolest mesh technologies out there. I mean, it doesn't solve the specific problem of how do we put you know, how do we get devices around a campground that can connect to each other, but it does solve the problem of how do, do we, um, how do we pair uh, encryption terms with a routing protocol, which is one of probably the, the biggest outstanding <coughs> questions on the internet today. I mean, the, the, one of the questions I kind of have is, you know, if my ISP doesn't offer IPv6, and his ISP doesn't want to have IPv, doesn't want to offer IPv6, uh, the only way we can get on IPv6 right now is to use a tunnel like Hurricane Electric, and set up, which is essentially runs like a VPN. Ha has anybody thought of any way of like just routing IPv6 traffic over IPv4? So basically, kind of like um, if even so, basically we're not tunneling it through stuff. We're except for tunneling it through IPv4 because right now as it is. You're basically throwing all your traffic through a, essentially a VPN service. Right, right. So is there a way to get that great IPv6? Like, so I can communicate directly. You know, if you have IPv4 at your house for your right. ISP, and I have IPv4 at my house at, with my ISP, and we want to communicate directly using IPv6, how come there isn't, is, is there anything out there to, 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 to directly communicate from my Is there anything to run IPv6 over an IPv4 connection? Right. As far as I know, no. Well, CJDNS, CJDNS kind of does that, but then you're left with the, how do you, it strikes me that what you're describing is physically impossible, because how do you do the NAT to get, like, if I, so here I am behind my IPv4 router, and three or four of my friends are next to me. We appear to you all to have the same IPv4 address. So how then can we, without without a middle, without a, a NAT in the middle, how can we possibly do? Well, I'm, I'm talking about essentially, like, you know, I have control over my router where I live, you know, and if he has control over his router, he actually has an IPv4 address that's his IPv4 address. Okay, but, but I think I think part of the, the key issue here is like, how, are we, how do we hide IPs? How do IPs become not such a big deal or whichever? And I think the real answer to that, um, and this is kind of a perhaps a pseudo way of getting people involved in mesh networking, is uh, there's a website, don't try going to it here, you'll never get to it, uh, no, it's openwireless.org where the idea is, and this is happening in a lot of towns, where they are just opening up all their routers. No passwords, no nothing, and they're trying to get a degree of plausible deniability to where the IP address, the idea, I think what needs to happen is the social change has to occur to where your IP address does not legally represent you. Okay, and so then really I, I think a lot of that, it's, it's interesting, but I think a lot of that may not be uh, necessary. So that's, uh, other questions? And in general, if you're if you're into this idea of doing IPv6 over IPv4, and you're willing to kind of lift off of the normal traffic on the internet, then definitely look into CJDNS. It's the only thing I've really I, I have IPv6 set up before, and um, but I'm using a Hurricane Electric tunnel. Well, with AT.net, you can basically if you're willing to configure your router the right way. You can get your you can get IPv. They'll give you a slash 64 network, so you get I don't know how many millions of IP addresses that is for you to use um, in your own house. Uh, but you, you're essentially tunneling your traffic through their servers. Uh, a gentleman across the tent noted earlier that you seem to have 
conflicting goals. You know, the, the, one of the goals seems to be improving access to the internet, and the other goal seems to be transcending access to the internet. Uh, and I'm asking, don't those goals conflict? Um, I don't necessarily think so. Um, I, I mean, like, do people want to be able to connect to the internet, or do they want to be able to talk to each other and share photos and um, information and check things? So that is an interesting idea, actually, or concept, is the fact that Bitcoin relies on the internet, uh, the greater internet as we know it. Um, so I guess that would be one thing, but... Well, the, uh, there is technically a uh, Bitcoin-only Wi-Fi network right now. I think it cancels out web traffic or something. But, yeah. Um, that, is a, that is something that you would need general internet for. Um, I mean, show of hands, do you want, like, an internet internet, or do you want a local net internet? Both. Both? Both? Uh, okay, show of hands. To provoke a discussion about whether these are in conflict, right? Well, I was just asking, yeah, like, for you people that are developing mesh networking technologies, you've got opportunity costs. You can either devote your time to improving right. general access to the internet, or you can devote your time to transcending this and making local, the fire chat type of stuff, and making local networks. And those are, I feel like, it's an opportunity cost no matter which one you choose. So, I mean, I would prefer a local one just to try it out and then. Yeah, I'd, I'd second wanting to go back to more localized, uh, like the BBS system from the 90s, I actually think is superior to the internet we know today. Uh, but that's just me. I guess it depends what you think the internet is. If you think the internet is, like what is the internet? Is it the root certificate authorities? Is it the existing DNS? Is it, you know, is it Verizon and AT&T and, and the government? Like, what, what, it depends what you think the internet is. Um, it's kind of the international network where you can send data across the globe to 7 billion plus people rather than, I don't know, 1,200 people at a, at a campground. So the answer is the international network where you can send data across the globe instead of just sending data to people at a campground. And so I guess my impression is if you're only, if the only answer is, um, mere dumb connectivity, which I, I think, d you know, dumb connectivity to me is always better than smart connectivity. I, I want dumb pipes. I think those are really fun to, to build things on. Um, but what then, if that's your answer, then it strikes me that the answer to your deeper question of are these things in conflict then becomes no, because where is the mixed opportunity cost? I'm not sure I see the difference in opportunity cost, because in either case, you are trying to provide access down to the next node in as dumb a way as possible and presumably two nodes down the chain they may have a gateway that lets you net onto the internet so i'm not sure i see the maybe if you maybe i'm missing a part of the question I, i'm not sure i see the difference in opportunity cost i also just want to point out again i've never you know i i haven't actually worked on mesh networking i, I feel like I'm, I'm happy to try to answer questions um, but I, I, you know, my, my uh, primarily I work on the internet today and on the web and on server ops and things like that. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is an enormous opportunity cost, and maybe it comes in the form of sort of your the attitude of your team or things like this. But it seems like from an actual, from the standpoint of what are we going to run on the routers, I'm not sure I see a difference. It strikes me that it's exactly the same technology, uh, besting exactly the same challenges to connect people on a campground to the internet as it is to connect people on the campground to each other. Alright, actually I got a question. So one possible uh, I can probably talk loud for the One possible solution is uh, perhaps, you know, if we have the network, a mesh network, uh, you know, peer to peer, but there's always going to be a handful of us that have internet access. That is not Rogers. I mean, I was walking down the uh, the park model RVs, and a few of them had satellite dishes. So there is other stuff out there. Is it possible to set up that kind of network where you set up the the peer to peer, but then it goes uh, to whatever the the local you know, yeah exactly that goes out to the internet. Now those pipes might get congested because if you only got six of them and all of us are trying to access the internet, 
but it kind of does both. You know, is that how how plausible is that? Um, I think it's very plausible. The only problem is that a lot of the hardware that we're using does not have the software that allows for it. Operating systems are not designed, I think, to communicate that way, but that is changing. There is an operating system system called Byzantine Linux, and this is specifically designed to do exactly what you were talking about, where because uh, you know where you can one person can have that that gateway to the the big bad internet, and then it can also connect to the rest of you know of, of everything around. But um, I think that's. That kind of gets into the idea, though, that we need to get more used to using laptops where the software can actually be configured. Because if you're talking about wanting to do a lot of this on iOS and Android, even though things like Open Garden, at least with Android, kind of allow for that, um, these companies that control those OSs are going to be closing in their ecosystems, and they won't allow for that. But laptops, you can absolutely do exactly what was just talked about. I think I, maybe I need to ask my own question here, but I, I think you, you're you're sort of saying that maybe. Um, Operating systems, uh, and I uh, operating systems aren't built for this. And I haven't used iOS. I haven't looked, poked around the iOS browser in a while. But it seems like can we? Uh, maybe a superior solution is just to allow people like uh, Port Portfest 2014 Secure to set up a Sox proxy, and then you go into your browser and say, right? I mean, that's isn't that what? I, again, I think I'm trying to school myself. Isn't that what Sox proxies are for? And won't that work pretty wonderfully for that situation? Would they allow for? I'm questioning what. It's, it's a good question. I'm questioning whether or not they would allow for it to do both. Like because if we're transmitting from device to device, which is what I understood it, I don't know that the this. Yeah, the Sox proxy would allow you to separate the two, but I don't. I don't know if, like, if you had a Windows machine. Okay, I'm sorry. If you had a Windows machine, you know, I, Windows won't allow you to, generally will not allow you to connect to multiple networks, but then I guess maybe that wouldn't be an issue if you're using SOX. Uh, but anyway, I, I have nothing more to say on the matter. <laughs> you can you use multiple browsers if you really wanted to set that up? Well, I, what I, I guess we all have, it's funny, we did have different imaginations about this. I, I, I was imagining, uh, I, I was imagining sort of a, you know, a, some sort of voluntary distributed DNS table, maybe like super low scale, like a, you know, how many domains do we really need the Porcupine Festival? We'd have dot .pork, oh, and yeah. have just a really simple key value store that we share every five minutes with the rest of the nodes. And if you're operating a SOX proxy, the social rule is you have to resolve dot .pork domains. Right? right. Yeah. right? <laughs> it seems like and if you don't, then you'll be ostracized. If you, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe it's not enforceable in that sense, but I, I don't know. This is starting to get to the, the edge of my knowledge of the stuff. It seems like where there's a will, there's a way. I'm sure we can pull it off. But. And, and those people who have the access to the internet, if they wanted to, they could always just set up a VPN locally and say, go to my you know, 10 dot whatever dot port domain and the, the response is people who want to do a gateway can set up their own VPN and invite people to their own party with beer and hookers, or what is the future wrong with him? Hookers and blows. I got a number of different answers there. I'm not sure. I have missed a couple of seasons of Futurama, or what? Um, so, uh, but but that seems back to the other problem, right? If you're sending all of your traffic through a VPN, then I guess you're going to go into the VPN and out to get to local resources, which is exactly what you don't want, right? I thought VPNs could do the resolving well, I think that's that's what we're saying, right? Is you you we you you have to if you're doing a gateway, there are some certain rules. You have to run a DNS, and it has to resolve .port domains. And that way, if people are connected to you, they automatically get resolution of of .port domains. I don't know. I, I have no idea what the state of the art is on this stuff. I'm really psyched to learn. And I I don't I don't know about you two, but I've some people in the audience certainly can school me on this stuff too. So if you have, uh, you know, if you know what the the latest is here, then let's hear from you. Or, or also, again, I just want to say, or if you don't know what the latest is and you really want a, to ask a total beginner question, um, that's helpful too. It will help people who've heard it a million times to hear it again. You know. Is it the point to creating these little independent networks to be able to link them and spread them so that they become as big as an, altern an alternative to the real internet? Isn't that the obvious point of all this? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I understand the question. I, I suspect you may have asked a question that will divide the panel. <laughs> yes and no. I think it's to, in general, make the internet more resilient so that it doesn't matter if the whole, whole world is connected or if, you know, something happens to one area or, like, one node, then it won't, like, segregate off an entire area. But independent, a second internet, a third. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's a way to go uh, if everybody wants to do that because I think, I mean, you can have at one point these things can kind of interconnect, but they should never be sent, like, what happened with Tor uh, last year was in, uh, in Ireland, or was it Freedom Hosting? When Freedom Hosting was taken down, Tor took a big hit. And so setting up these multiple independent networks like you're talking about that could possibly like work as cells and continually uh, interconnect with each other, then yeah, you, you lose that point of centralization that even Tor falls that's prey what, to. That's what Ernie wants, right? Ernie Hancock? Yeah. That's what Ernie wants? Yeah, I imagine Ernie. Ernie wants a lot of things. He wants his independence. <laughs> I think, uh, at least the way that I think about this stuff, the answer is no, that's not the point of mesh networking. Uh, I think that, uh, and I think probably most people will say yes, but my impression, uh, and maybe it's because I haven't really, um, you know, I haven't dug down and, and read the code that powers these projects yet, but uh, my impression is that the bus topology, the really long fiber that goes from here to California is super useful, and we don't want that to go away. What we want to do is decorate it with small, uh, meshed in tree in star topologies around it, but generally the long fibers of bus topology across large land masses, over mountains, under oceans, under rivers, I think is super useful, and that's one thing the internet does very well right now, and we don't want that to go anywhere. The cables that exist are going to continue to be useful as long as they do exist, and um, I don't think that it's particularly organic to suggest that we're going to have a series of like 50,000 hops to get your packet from here to California if the person you want to talk to is in California. What you want is a small number of hops to a bus and then bus transit across the country and then a small number of hops to the end destination endpoint. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe it will develop the way that you suggest. Maybe uh, the technology is such that it does end up working better to have a, a chaotic uh, string of, of hops across large land masses. Um. So if the bus line breaks down, you can still take hops all the way down the, the countryside? <laughs> I, I, I just don't know. I, I suspect, I mean, what, what's, uh, what is like the largest number of hops that is typical on an existing mesh network? It's not in the thousands, it's in, it's, it's in the dozens, right? So I, I don't know how possible it really, it really is. Um, I, I think probably, from my perspective, what I imagine is competing bus lines that have transit at different speeds that charge different rates, right? Oh, I've got forever to transfer this file. I don't really need fast transit. Uh, or I'm playing a game. I need low latency, and I'm not too concerned about my bandwidth, right? There will be different bus topology frameworks, uh, including the actual physical infrastructure, like a, a fiber line, that meet these needs in, for different scenarios and compete with each other by having good connectivity to the mesh and star endpoints. That's what I have always kind of imagined. And also, I think um, in terms of, like, say, only having one bus line and that being taken out, I think the important part is that the, the local part can still function, so you still have functionality. Right now, if, like, you know, AT&T goes out right now, most of us can't use the Internet or something, you know, or if, you know, the Wi-Fi goes out here, most of us are, are done. So um, it's really about making it more efficient when those problems arise and being able to kind of route around those problems. Can I have one quick addendum for you? Oh, no, no. I think well, another thing to remember is that um, as time goes forward, at least so far, sneaker netting has continually outpaced the internet. <laughs> right? So it, it probably over time, if you like, if a huge bus line goes down, it will probably be just as fast to give someone a gigantic flash drive, whatever the largest amount of storage they can carry on a motorcycle is, and have them drive across the country in two days and deliver it. You know what I mean? Like, you can almost imagine uh, for really huge traffic that was going to take two days to transfer over the old internet, 
could, you could probably do a lot faster by a, a you know a really super duper sneaker net. Did, did you, you ever know? see the XKCD comic about how many SD cards you could fit in a shoe box or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall if I've seen it or not. Every once in a while he'll do like an extended, it's not like part of the regular comic, it'll be like a blog post. Here, let, let's have you. The, 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 the comment is about an XKCD uh, that features SD cards in a shoebox. I forget the exact details, but yeah, there was, if, if you, I bet you if you search XKCD sneaker net, that he basically did a big blog post that explains like, uh, he did all this, uh, the math of like how many, megabytes per second ends up being to like you uh, send a shoebox full of SD cards to the post office and stuff and uh, a bunch of other weird experiments but then he like, said how much the uh, SD cards, uh, a shoebox full of SD cards would have cost and stuff like that so it's kind of an interesting blog post. Oh I'm sure, blog it blows the internet away by a multiple orders of magnitude. But it's expensive. Who I, does the, somebody does the pigeon thing too, right? Where they put a memory card on a pigeon. Who does the MIT or something, right? There's an actual official IETF uh, uh, RFC on how to do IP over AV. IP over AV, yeah. <laughs> so, so I wanted to kind of expand. I was going to say similar to what uh, Paige was going to say, but expand further. Like if the bus breaks down, instead of trying to find a way to bounce over it, have a local copy of Wikipedia, have a local copy of the yeah. OpenStreetMaps database. Have Identica and the Diaspora nodes running there. Have storage is getting cheaper faster than yeah, bandwidth. Okay. Let's act that way. As, as I understand, a powering thing. I don't me. understand where this whole the whole move for the cloud has come from suddenly in the past. In the I can tell. I can feel that's that's directly my area of expertise. I can feel that one. Oh, okay. One, one last thing I was going to say, I, as I understand, in Athens, their mesh network has a Craigslist type thing all, already set up locally, is that right? That, that's the last thing I want to say. Yeah. I, I guess I just want to, I, I don't, since this is not a panel about uh, cloud computing, I guess I just want to say um, cloud computing is actually really awesome for, for a number of needs. If you're working on a, a if you're working on a web startup yeah. and you need to provision and deploy servers in an automated way, Oh, it's awesome. You can throw more computing power at it without having to configure your own metal. I mean, and I consider that just virtualization. My my thing was, how come everyone is so, like, wanting to put their data on Google Drive and Dropbox and services like that, when local storage is so cheap? Like, you know, I, I think it's total. I, 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 to the way I think this is a really obvious, it's just convenience, yep. right? Google, Dropbox is super convenient. Google Drive and Gmail are super convenient. I use all three of those. And I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm a little bit ashamed of it, but I do it um, because I need to. I need to live in this world. I need to work effectively. I need to be a professional. And, and you know, it's like these are tools that, uh, that, that make li our lives more convenient. I think that that's a good question if we start talking about homomorphic encryption um, and some of these technologies that are coming down the pike to be able to, to deal with that. Um, and you know, even, even to do convenient cloud computing, presumably in a mesh structure, that starts to look more like BitTorrent, right? Where you have your devices in the swarm are continually uh, torrent sharing uh, encrypted copies of your cloud stuff. You know, like BT Sync, yeah, but BT Sync, is BT Sync really ready for the big time? My impression is not quite. Um, are, are you saying we're out of time? We have a whole bunch more questions. Go for it. Ah. I don't think you have anything coming up after us. Okay. okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's right. Just uh, one last comment on that. I think the one of the main reasons that cloud storage, which I think is more being referenced uh, than cloud computing, but cloud storage, the reason that's so popular is because people are consistently getting their devices uh, stolen and the numbers are rising in how that happens. Uh, so I think that's a really big issue, and going local doesn't really solve that, but I definitely agree with going back to local storage. But um, admittedly, the, the, the people that are stealing your devices with all that data on it are governments of the world. So you might want to solve that one. Uh, Jack, let's have Jack. I just wanted to say for follow-up, we already have a group called Alt IT on Facebook, and there's all eight of us there. We welcome all the rest of you there. So, A L T space I T. Get on Diaspora. Yeah, anywhere else but Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Do it. Create it. Yeah. Homomorphic encryption. 
In 30 seconds, the idea that you can send an encrypted blob to the to the cloud to a storage provider, they don't know what it is, but when you wanna when you want to execute a function against it, say you want to search for a particular word in your email, you can encrypt the search term, send it to them, and they're able to search the encrypted blob with the encrypted search term and give you encrypted result give you encrypted results that you then decrypt. They never knew anything. They never were able they never knew anything about what they stored or what they searched for. That's the idea there. And it's an open problem in mathematics, I understand. There's a mathematical proof that it can be done, but there's not actually a software implementation. Someone a couple weeks ago posted on Hacker News that they had an implementation. Uh, we'll see what but that's that's gonna be here in the next few years and that's like a, another game changer. I might have missed the first part of this, but dealing with uh, mesh networks, we've had a 10 year argument discussion with the Kurtzwell site, the MindX. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. But the subject has been these things right here walkie talkies, peer to peer wireless amorphous self repairing networks. And at first, 10 years ago, the discussion started out with 50 people, technical people, arguing it was impossible to set up a network where each walkie-talkie passed a signal. And you could actually send a signal from the East Coast to the West Coast as far as possible with no tie into the existing network. Well, the, the technology is available. So my biggest concern about any network, especially one carrying Bitcoin, is that as soon as the powers that be know about Bitcoin, they know about they're freaking out right now. I think the, we have to move towards a wireless network where every signal passes the signal to the next person. Metcast law comes into play. The number of nodes on the network increases the quality and the robustness of the signal. So basically, um, do, have you guys been following anything on the, on the, uh, the new technology that makes these things possible? So I, I just want to understand. Oh, let me just give you yeah. the URL. If anyone wants to go, it's kurtzwellai.net. K-U-R-T-Z, Kurtzwell, however you spell it. Yeah, dot net. And the, the uh, forum, the, the thread is called uh, Tesla Peercom, wireless walkie-talkies. So are you saying you have an implementation of a push-to-talk device that transits through, uh, you know, a, a, a self-healing mesh across several hops with each device acting Not as several. a simple node? Uh, any number of hops. And the technology, yes, the technology is absolutely possible. The first problem was how do you directionalize the signal? Let's say you wanted to talk to your friend in California and focusing the, the uh, communication down that line. So it's, it's available. Cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to checking it out. I don't know if, if you all have heard of it. I, the one thing, one little snippet there that I'm prepared to respond to. Am I? I'm sorry. Am I? I feel like I'm not, I didn't think I had anything to add. Now I feel like I'm talking too much. I um, I'm a little reluctant to, to like always think about well, what are we? How are we going to do Bitcoin? I, here I am wearing a Bitcoin shirt too. I'm not actually. I, I think this is the, a big problem with Bitcoin, and that Bitcoin will eventually fail for this reason because it's so atomic. Right, it's the, it relies on the entire network no, being able to know, find, examine, and interpret the single longest blockchain. And it's, so it's, it's not, in the way that I think about decentralization, Bitcoin is not decentralized, it's just that the center is everywhere. Uh, true decentralization would mean that you could divide the swarm, execute legal transactions on both sides, reunite the swarm, and the, the blockchain or, or whatever the uh, authority device that will recognize both legal trans legal transactions on both sides as legitimate. Uh, and it's not hard in your head to think about how that will work. We're obviously not going to get into it here, but the protocol is not hard to think, to think through. Yeah, I'm actually pretty comforted to hear someone else say that uh, because Bitcoin really does have a huge fatal flaw that, or I mean, it has a bunch of them, but that's one of them uh, to where, but I will say this, that with radio, there is it, there's been proven transactions, just transactions, this isn't ascending of the whole blockchain, um, over data packet radio, which I think is a really incredible technology to look into, which is probably very much related to what James was talking about there. Um, and, and I mean, a lot of things can be done with it. You know, granted with data packet radio, you're not going to be transmitting YouTube videos, 
uh, because you know radio just doesn't. Well, we know of his radio doesn't work that way. Um, but you can probably still find somebody to have sex with. So what else do you need for? <laughs> And you certainly could transmit the hash of a mentoring yeah. form. Yeah. Yeah. On the note of a uh, data packet radio, I'm not a ham radio operator. I don't know if we have any ham radio operators in here right now. Okay, maybe you can talk to us about the FCC regulations on encrypted data packet radio. Because as I understand it, that's a no-go. Oh, I thought it was only over GMRS. Is it illegal over ham too? Yeah, uh, basically ham radio uh, prohibits any type of encryption or whatever uh, when you're use when you're doing license jam radio stuff um, the uh, the only there's like one exemption for like remote control of like repeaters and satellites and stuff you can send them encrypted commands um, but one of the problems with like packet radio and ham radio is like we were having a conversation about um, the Bow fangs and stuff about doing data over stuff radios like this and one of the problems is with radios like this there's pretty much a 1200 baud limit um, maybe a little bit more than that it, it might be possible to get speeds fast enough to transmit voice but that's about it for data on U, uh, VHF UHF Uh, just uh, getting back to basics, uh, coming from a dumb old IP4 guy, uh, I'm still trying to get my arms around the term mesh networking. What exactly is meant by that? Now, is that a new network topology that specifically makes use of IP6? Uh, is it a whole new uh, set of uh, applications over and above uh, TCP IP? Is it a parallel? Uh, physical implementation to the current internet is all the above, some of the above, or none of the above? Yeah, it depends on how it's implemented. So uh, there are some technologies that run on top of TCP and or like kind of, yeah, that run on top but kind of work with it in terms of the IP address, such as Open Garden. Um, but it is an abstract term. It's not yeah, it's a very abstract term if you look it up. I don't know. It, I mean, it's usually related to networking and like the aspect of a peer-to-peer -peer network. So instead of it being hierarchical, it'll be you know nodes connecting to each other. It, it can still actually take that form, but um, at some sense, there is no one centerpiece. I think generally, if you're hearing the term mesh networking, maybe it means it does mean different things to different people, but everybody that uses the term at a minimum is talking about a distinct network topology, either literally at the infrastructural layer or an, an abstraction at the application or transport layers. They're talking about the difference between a bus network where you have a long line and little buds connected off of it, or a star topology where you have one in the center and lots of people connected off it, instead talking about a mesh topology where you have a node and a node and a node and a node and a node, and this one's connected to both this guy and this guy. And each node, we don't have a projector here, I actually had a deck that I was going to use to make this point, but um, the, the, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, what you're talking about is is the individual nodes also acting as routers in some sense, either literally in terms of the infrastructure or metaphorically in an abstraction via some kind of implementation of transport or application layer politics. <laughs> you know, but Jenna, I think right, it's safe to say everybody who's using the word mesh networking is at least making that critique about network topology, right? But with one distinction, the mesh, net, the mesh network that we're talking about, that you're describing, ultimately dumps in to the, the, main, the main network. That's the problem. It automatically, it's a mesh, like you're saying, it's all the little nodes connecting and passing the signal peer to peer. But if it dumps into the main network, you're, you're in the main network. So that's no good. It doesn't have to, but it's generally referred to as two different Again, I think we, I think even, even to use terms like the main network and the internet, it sounds like we kind of disagree about what these things are. Well, the minute um, you dump into any centralized network, you defeated the whole purpose of the peer-to-peer -peer amorphous network. Yeah, we're going to get, I can feel the, who wants to, who has fists of fury? <laughs> Out of the different mesh networking protocols, uh, 
which one is kind of more prominent now, and out of that protocol group with the prominent ones, which one is kind of strictly layer two and doesn't care whether it's IP or IPX, SPX, if you can tear that out of the ground somewhere? I miss the low latency of IPX, SPX. I really do. Like, I remember playing Descent, the original Descent on IPX, and it's just like, you have latency of like, you know, way sub millisecond. Like, where did that go? And we also, are you going? No. no. We also, another thing, and we're talking about IPX, XPX, at the, when, you know, I like to think about it at each layer. When I think about the, the uh, infrastructure layer, um, I wonder where all the copper wires went. I, I, I like the idea of having copper wires connecting the houses, right? It's a really nice way to transmit super low bandwidth, but also super low latency. Um, I think that stuff is kind of cool. I'd like to see us start to rebuild some of that infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it sounds like we have, um, I, I'm not sure whether we have disagreement about the sort of plausibly free large level networks because uh, we don't have a sense of what the technology will reveal or if it's because of an underlying socio-political belief. But uh, again, I think the main network, the internet, if, if you don't mean that as certificate authorities, centralized DNS, centralized routing, that kind of thing, and instead, you're talking about uh, large bus topology uh, transit services, then I think those are great, here to stay, good inventions, we'll keep them and, and, and build mesh and other topologies it's around them. It's, it's anything you have to pay for. Yeah. No, I don't think so. See, this is where I disagree too. I, 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 think we'll, I think what will happen, what will be exciting, we'll probably see it next year, we already see it this year at the Porcupine Festival, is people will have really smooth transit to some faraway place and they'll ask you to pay for transit. Uh, and you, you can even imagine a routing protocol where um, some, some bit of transit, some, some denomination of transit, uh, you could pay for it at the micro level with cryptocurrency, right? I really need to get these 500 megabytes to California as soon as possible, and there could be a super simple API that charges you a tiny bit of cryptocurrency and zooms your 500 megabytes down and, and you get the the, the hash of it signed by your, your homeboy on the other end and, and you know everybody is happy about that. So I'm not sure that's true. I think, I think that you will still see uh, owners of large transit infrastructures continuing to charge and hopefully actually competing with each other uh, to, to do uh, high bandwidth long distance transit. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, yeah, I, I used to maintain copper facilities back years ago, and they're great, except they cost a lot to maintain. That's a problem. Two, IPX, SPX, yeah, I used to work on those networks, but they were like uh, within a facility. They're, it's right. not routable, right? Right. That's the problem. Now, the, 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 big, the, the big issue is, I think we've got two different scenarios here we're describing, okay? One is the scenario we have now where we have the big bad state that we have to, to get away from. Once the state is gone in some foreseeable future, then yeah, all of these technologies will be put to the fore. I mean, yeah, where there is a, an aggregation, uh, uh, that, you know, a aggregation of links that, that will be uh, cost effective and efficient, that's what we'll use, big, ass, big bus technology. Where, you know, individual nodes is good. In other words, in the future, without the state, then all of these things come into play. But for right now, okay, mesh networks and things like that give the security and the privacy and, you know, keeps us away from the big bad state. And I think, you know, what James is talking about is like, until we have that issue dealt with, it's in our best interest to find ways of, of you know going under the radar and staying off the, the big you know the, the big big iron so to speak. Uh, however, the better encryption gets, the big iron really becomes less of a liability. Yeah, so, I don't. I, you know, but, but I just wanted to point out there's two different you know there, there's now and then there's the, the future we all want. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, some may regard this as dystopian, but it seems to me that the your choice at the infrastructural layer has exactly nothing to do with how easily your packets can be read, right? That's, that's entirely, as far as I can tell, entirely the domain of how well you are generating and sharing your, your keys. It doesn't seem to matter what metal the, the, the packets cross. And I think that that, 
I'm not sure, I haven't thought through whether this is dystopian or not, but it seems like that's increasingly true, that the only thing that really matters is uh, how well you're doing uh, as far as encryption on your endpoints, and not so much the metal that you're transiting. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, at the same time, in the real world, we live in a situation where the NSA can listen to every one of our phones, and that would have been really hard if we were also using copper wires, so... <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it's funny, because it, it, you make a good point, but then, I don't know, the way that... It just seems like it's going in a direction where, um, the you know, as you say, the, the encryption is really the line of defense, and it's less so the, the network topology. Um, I, I, I guess, and on some level also, you're, like... Really long fiber lines work really well for, for relatively low latency and very high bandwidth. They work like really super awesomely well. So I think it's like to our benefit to make sure that we continue to develop, uh, you know, really good, uh, you know, encryption technology that that abstracts uh, all. I'm pointing to your tour t-shirt that abstracts all the, uh, you know, the 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 tasks that have to be done to handle the traffic at the endpoints. Um, I know we're over, and I appreciate the panel entertaining everyone, but uh, I'm curious, I have a pragmatic question as far as, like, Amirataki was mentioned, and I think Athens was mentioned. How are they bootstrapping those sort of mesh networks? Is it just their right amount of people in that place to get them going, or do they have, you know, can you gamify this somehow? Can you create incentives? Mesh coin. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Torcoin. Torcoin. Yeah. Torcoin. Yeah, I think that's actually being worked on. Yeah. yeah. But is it, the proof of bandwidth problem is still yeah. open, though, right? Yeah, I don't I think it's. They, I thought they had an algorithm for it, but maybe they don't. And Caleb James Delisle, I don't know if I'm supposed to put him on blast, I will, told me that proof of bandwidth on CJDNS is trivial and it's already implemented. That's what he told me. Um, as far as gamifying, I love the idea. I think uh, Google actually cracked that egg with uh, Ingress, which is a game that essentially you are, it's an augmented reality game, and you have to go around and find these, whatever it is inside the game, and you have to walk to them. Now really, it's just a grand scheme to make Google Maps better. It's not really a game. You know, I mean, they, they turned it into a game. Um, but I think if you could do that, if you did something like Ingress, where you have to go to this place, or you got to be here, or you got to set up a repeater here, or something like that, uh, you could totally gamify mesh networking in, in that process. And it strikes me that if you're willing to do off-band transit of your keys, then that, then it also becomes trivial, right? It, it, let's, like, if we go back to having key signing parties, where you just get all your friends together and sign each other's keys, then you could verify, you could, right, I guess. Then key signing party uh, later this week. There's a key signing party at Porkfest. Yeah, I'm not sure what day it's uh, checking. Right, it's on Friday. It's on Friday. Friday at what time? I'm not sure. Someone's got to see it. Yeah, look on the Mesh Network. It'll tell you what time. <laughs> the, the, the time of it will be sent out to everyone whose key has been signed by that gentleman over there. So, um, in terms of the Oakland network, as far as I know, they're not, like, they don't have any income at all. It's all volunteer-based. They've gotten a lot of donations of hardware and stuff, and they worked with other companies. I know they're actually getting, um, they're, they have, like, kind of these main nodes that are kind of businesses that are supplying a lot of internet, so I know they're hooked up to the Internet Archive, which is based in Richmond. Um, but general, just community support. The key signing party is at 12.30 on Friday at the lower uh, picnic tent. And what do people need to bring? I guess um, something with your PGP key on it, and I don't know, usually they require government ID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, you, you may bring your computer too, because um, I'm I actually uh, going to have an SKS server on my Raspberry Pi. And Chris, interestingly enough, was going to the guy running the thing was going to have that himself, but he forgot it, and I just told Chris from Ubuntu. Chris Case. Yeah. 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 Anyway, um, what I was going to say, um, half jokingly, but maybe this will be taken seriously on, on the subject of um, having a mesh coin and the problem of, of not being able to do Bitcoin transactions. Let's just start an altcoin. For pork fest. Uh, key signing parties usually what people do is bring uh, your bring copies of your PGP key okay. fingerprint. Uh, they say bring, bring copies of your PGP key fingerprint and uh, notepad and pen and basically write 
they, they, they suggest that you write down uh, the person whose who's keys you want to sign later. Go find them on teach, uh, go, go find them on a key server somewhere and verify it, and then go do it later. And like one of the excuses was, don't bring your laptop because your laptop might get stolen or whatever. But uh, you can do whatever you want. So you don't need to bring your laptop to do a PGP key signing part as long as you have your PGP key or a fingerprint of your PGP key or whatever you can give it to people, and then they can sign your keys. Cool. Well, that, you know, let's have a lot of people, even if you don't know what PGP key signing parties is, it'll be super helpful if you generate one and get it signed this year. For, yeah, if for you bring your laptop, there will be plenty of people to show you how to set up PGP key. Yeah, do that. Do that. So I think we're going to end it here. Um, feel free to ask us any more questions uh, throughout the week. Me and Brian are actually doing a talk on Friday at 6 here. Um, I think it's called Digital Evolution and Internet Freedom. Um, yeah. Just, yeah. And I'm, I'm playing Friday at 12.30 in the big pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.